Right now, I'm here with Mike Corrado. He is a senior product manager with the DSLR group at Nikon. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Good. I'm doing great. How you doing? Great. So let's talk about the D3. You guys announced this at Photo Plus last year. It's out shipping. People are using it now. Let's talk about, for someone that's doing wedding and portrait, how they can utilize the D3. It has such great high SO capabilities. And just let's talk about the camera. It's an amazing piece of equipment. Well, you know, obviously this camera's taken off and it's really groundbreaking for the industry and everybody wants to say that, but this is really a reality. We're talking ISOs as high as 25,600 and, and in the real world of 200 to 6400, you can do things you've never been able to do before. And it really starts with the FX format sensor and with this FX format sensor, now we have a full 35 millimeter size sensor which accommodates a larger pixel size of 12.1 megapixels. 12 megapixels, you know, people get caught up in how many you have. The reality is 12, 12, 12 megapixels generates 34 megabyte JPEGs and 78 megabyte RAW files. So it's more functional to be able to complete a workflow very quickly, yet still maintain commercial quality. Uh, Mike, let's talk about the sensor itself because people get confused. A, it's a full frame sensor or it's so close within tenths of a millimeter. But really, I think, let's talk about the, uh, the pixel bucket. I mean, it basically has the same uh, micron sensor light gathering part of the sensor as like a medium format digital. So you have such a large latitude. Tell me about how all that sort of works out and why the bigger pixel bucket is better in the sensor than having something that's all squished together. Well, basically the bigger pixel accommodates better content, better wavelengths of light. And of course, utilizing the lens system that we have, the micro lenses on top of every pixel, that helps the quality as well. And then the processing takes it over. Of course, it starts with the lens, the lens that you mount to the camera, and then it goes through this processing system after it goes through the sensor. And that processing system is as key a component as anything. And we have an XP processor now which really takes into account uh, the ability to, to fire off frames fast, 9 frames per second with the camera, but also run 12 or 14-bit capture through a 16-bit pipeline and still keep you shooting, like 60-some-odd JPEGs, 68 JPEGs uh, in a row. Uh, to keep you firing and it's all building to that great quality image. The larger size pixel, I could say 8.45 microns and I don't know if anybody would understand that, but it's a much larger, larger pixel so the content is so much better. Yeah, and like you said, you wouldn't if, if, if the content wasn't better, you wouldn't be able to use these such high ISOs and get such great images. I mean, you can routinely shoot a D3 how high as with an ISO on a... 6400. You know, you can walk into ambient light situations and do things that you could never do before. And you can shoot not necessarily just the fast glass, the 1.4 lenses like the 85-1.4, but two eights. And, and, and at 4, at 5.6, if you really want to work depth of field, and you're not noticing visible noise at those high ISOs. You may see a grain pattern pick up, but it's not nearly the grain pattern what we used to see uh, of what we used to see with film. The simple grain, so, noise ratio is just incredible here. Sometimes grain's not bad. No, it's not. So if you wanted to pump it even further, 12,800 ISO or 25,006 will give you even more grain. And I, and I think about that as, as key as what you're saying, it's grain. There's a difference between having grain in an image and noise, and I've seen the Nikon stuff with the high ISO, right. it looks like grain, it doesn't look like noise. There's that's, a difference. That's amazing, and that's one of the things the engineers have really capitalized on, is utilizing the size of the pixel, getting the content in, working with the six speed processing system to generate that grain pattern effect as opposed to the noise. Masking and, and, and disguising the noise is what it's all about. And on top of that, the general defaults for the camera work really, really well. You can even apply more noise reduction. You can choose between low, normal, and high settings and add to what the camera's willing or capable of doing. And that really takes you to that 25,600 ISO. That's what's cool about having the dual card slot is I can shoot raw in one card, JPEG with its processing in the other, and have one ready to go for a slideshow or whatever else I want to use it for on the spot, but then I still have all my raw data on the other card. You talk about one of the most functional tools or features ever given to photographers, it's the second slot. But it's the, 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 the genius of the designers to say two compact flash card slots as opposed to two different types of card slots. Never understood that in any other system. So the reality is, is you, again, you can use it for overflow. Like you said, you can use it to shoot an F on one and JPEG on the other. But even more importantly, think about this. A wedding photographer, Cliff Mountner, gave me this one, is he actually backs up to the second card with raw files. So he has duplicates of his shoot 
on, on in the camera on two separate cards. God forbid a failure of a card happens. So it's also used as a solid backup. God, it's a, and it's a wise idea to back your stuff up because even no matter what kind of card you get, mm -hmm. at one point they're going to die. You know, you, you just never know. So you always want to make sure you're protected. I mean, especially a couple's wedding day. It's one of those precious moments you can't take back. You know, you can't do over again. And if your uh, car dies, you better run. That's it. <laughs> so give me a, a, a good setup, uh, D3. What's some good glass all around to shoot with at a wedding uh, event where I have uh, some, uh, some VR, some uh, stabilized glass that I can sort of use as a uh, maybe one or two pieces of glass? What's a good rig to set up with a D3 and some VR glass? Well, you know, I mean, if you're looking for a nice wide range, a lens like a 24 to 120 VR uh, is a perfect lens to be working with. And some may it's, it's one point. It's a 1.4. It's a variable aperture lens. But because you have the higher ISOs to work with, you have a lot more flexibility on that end. 70 to 200 with VR is also a great piece of glass to be working with. You know, to give yourself a little more telephoto coverage. You know, VR is is is, is critical in some situations. But again, having the ability to go to the higher ISO means lenses like we just recently introduced, the 14 to 24 and the 24 to 70, along with that 70 to 200, make a perfect three lens combination for anybody to go out with. I think shooting portraits in 85-1.4 is just the cream of the crop. You know, you look at those classic classic lenses that people keep coming back to us to, to, to buy, and the 85 is one of the most popular lenses ever at 1.4. Super sharp, just an incredible focal length for portraits. Now we're working with the FX format, so the 85 is an 85, the way photographers have used 85s their entire careers, so that's what we're back to now. You know, the DX sensor has its benefits. The FX sensor obviously takes us back to the focal length as photographers have been using it for decades, years. 100 years, 30 well, years. And I think, too, is the uh, really economically priced is the 51.4. Great piece of glass for the price. You know, when you look at this FX format coming into the Nikon line, you know, we've had our standard Nikkor glass and DX lenses. They're both incredible lenses, but DX lenses are built for the DX format. You can use them on the D3 because the D3 is smart enough to know that the DX glass is on it, so it automatically converts to a DX camera, and it masks out the outsides of the frame of the pixels that it's not using. But when you look back at the tried and true traditional lenses we've had, all of a sudden the 50 millimeter 1.4 is one of the most popular lenses we've ever had because it's affordable, it's a perfect portrait lens, and like you say, at 1.4, you got your depth of field, the minimized depth of field that you want, limited, and of course you got a nice piece of glass. Well, I mean, look around, look at Jay Mazel. Have you ever see Jay on his oh, yeah. Nikon? What's he got? A 51.4 always. Yep, and it's compact, it fits into the bag well, and it's a great general purpose lens when you're shooting people. Yeah. Uh, Mike, where can people find out more information about the D3? Do you have a specific site? Uh, where can people find out more information about using a D3 for wedding and portrait work and all kinds of stuff like that? Yeah, what we've done actually is we relaunched NikonUSA.com, and it's got a beautiful section on the cameras, the lenses, and, and it's more informative than we've ever had before. So uh, www.nikonusa.com. Mike, I appreciate your time. Great stuff. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Thank you very much.